Hello. Hello. Welcome to Are You Karate Kidding Me? Your resource for Cobra Kai and Karate Kid news, recaps, analysis, and all things Miyagi-verse? And general geekery as well. Yes. So I didn't really have any sort of preamble prepared for this episode. Yeah. So we could just jump right into it if you prefer. This is my third favorite episode. Ooh, okay. In all of Cobra Kai. All right, excellent. So I'm excited. This We're here to review Counterbalance. Before we get started, let me just say, find us on Apple Podcasts or in Overcast. Follow us on Twitter. Check us out on social media. And with that, let's get into today's episode, Counterbalance. Episode 5, Counterbalance. We open on Miguel. Yes, we open on Miguel waking up in his bed, getting up at an ungodly hour Mm -hmm. to do push-ups on his bedroom floor. That's right. Well, this is just the opening salvo of what is to be a classic, epic Karate Kid-style montage. It's a really well-lit shot of him getting up in bed and the little dust motes. Oh, no. It's it's all very well photographed. I I think there is a temptation when you're doing a montage to just bank it all out as quickly as possible. But no, there's a lot of care here in the lighting and the staging. There's a lot of soft, warm afternoon light. It's all very good. We've got Johnny grabbing Miguel, uh, helping him figure out how to slither. So Miguel's push-ups turn into Miguel doing push-ups at the dojo with Johnny watching, and now we have all these, like a sequence of scenes Mm -hmm. of Johnny kicking Miguel's ass, Miguel going out for a run somewhere in in California, in the valley. At a reservoir At the reservoir. Maybe that's Daniel and Mr. Miyagi's reservoir. I Google mapped it. I don't think it is, but it is close. That was my first thought as well, though. Yeah. So, but anyhow. it is an epic shot. Yes. So, meanwhile, Johnny's got a pitching machine, mm-hmm. and he's using it to throw baseballs well, at Miguel. Yeah, it's helping Miguel block and dodge. Uh, there's a couple of great lines here. Johnny yelling, "What does the Cobra do?" And Miguel yelling, "Slither!" Exactly, because uh, that's what I think when I think yeah. of cobras. Miguel's trying to tap out as Johnny is wrestling him. There's uh, also a very nice, uh, there's no tapping in karate. I feel like as a shout out to the late great Penny Marshall. And a league of their own. And a league of their own. There's no crying in baseball! Johnny's also giving him little tidbits of wisdom. You know, stuff like you can't always think your enemy will play by the rules. You want to fight fair? Dream on. Yeah. I, you know, I can't wait to see what comes of this later. Yeah. Indeed. Mm-hmm. And just when Johnny is is giving is is making sure that Miguel knows that he's still the boss, after Miguel sweeps his leg, mm-hmm. uh, in come the yoga people. Ah, uh, yes, it's time for yoga. Uh, so the women in stereotypical white lady yoga doers outfits yeah. pop up and bring their mats and a giant banner that they use to cover "Strike First, Strike Hard, No Mercy." Yeah, it says, "Our love is here to Namaste." Yeah. Johnny has to sublet the dojo to make rent. Yes. Just for now, yes. he tells Miguel. So that's it for Johnny and Miguel for the moment. Now we're going to jump over to the... Uh, Encino Hills Country Club. The Encino Hills Country Club. Where Daniel LaRusso is having lunch with a guy named... Armand Zarkarian, Armand yeah. Armand Zarkarian, who is played by... Armand Zarkarian, who's played by Ken Davitian. He is a businessman, a property owner, it seems. He's a gangster straight out of a Grand Theft Auto game. Nico, it's Roman. Let's go bowling. He seems to have his own hair. It's not sprayed on, although he could be the before picture of an infomercial. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, And he would be just that kind of guy. He's depicted as being kind of a gross dude. He's just kind of like eating lobster with his bare hands, which, you know, is delicious, but a little uncouth. Yeah. Meanwhile, the whole family is at the country club because... Over at the oyster bar, it looks like, or some kind of seafood bar, Sam and Amanda are loading up their plates, and Amanda's like, we're glad you're here. And Sam's like, yeah, I'm kind of on the outs with Yasmin and Moon. We can tell that Amanda's like, maybe you're better off this way. She glances mournfully at her cell phone. Yeah. And is showing a live stream of Yasmin and Moon enjoying themselves. Exactly. Meanwhile, speaking of uncouth, Anthony is at the kids' table drinking butter. Of course. 
course he is. As um, he and Zarkarian Skid Roland play a game of anything your dad can do, my dad can do better. Anthony has the ace in the hole because his dad knows karate and can kill your dad. He can kill your dad. Armand uh, Zarkarian brings up the uh, Boba's tea story yeah, from the, Boba the last tea episode. Yeah, incident and says, you know, so you're, you're feuding with Tom Cole. I hear you kicked a hot coffee out of his hand. And Daniel's just like, no, that was a Boba. And we get some comic relief as Ralph Macchio explains a Boba tea to a gangster guy. Exactly. In a scene that could be from My Cousin Vinny. Yeah. And he hasn't really quite played his full hand yet, but just from his attitude and his performance, Ralph Macchio is projecting that Daniel is scheming. He's flirting with the dark side a little bit this episode. He is. I mean, we see that Daniel, who has been frustrated, feeling powerless, is now trying to wheel and deal with this guy he says he's looking to expand. He wants some real estate in Reseda. Maybe like that strip mall that you own. Mm-hmm. And oh yeah, the one with the karate dojo in it. Yeah. So what's happening is that one way or another, Daniel is honing in on Johnny's lease. But the building where Johnny has his dojo. Daniel's giving us the impression that he's interested in buying that strip mall. Yeah, he wants to buy it right out from under Johnny, which would be pretty cold if he could pull it off. And Zarkarian's thinking about it. He's kind of got a Watto from Star Wars The Phantom Menace vibe about him. What? You think you're some kind of shit? I ain't waving your hand around like that. Mm, indeed. Meanwhile, over at Robbie's house, he rolls in with some groceries. Uh-huh. Uh, Robbie has a bit of a dinner date plan with his mom. Yeah, he's got the frozen pizzas that she likes. Clearly, he's the one who goes to the grocery store in this family. Yeah. Um, and his mom is on her way out. She's dressed up uh, again. Looks like she's going to go to one of her usuals. Yes, Shana, Ro- yeah. yeah. Robbie kind of makes the sideways comment. He'd like to hang out with her if she's not too hungover. Yeah, and she kind of smarmily is like, oh, come on, don't be like that. And it's interesting, this scene, because they play it really well where Robbie is legit disappointed in his mom, mm-hmm. but they have a relationship and he is not, he doesn't want to tell her to get lost. Like he really wants to have a relationship with her. And then she's like, you know, the men that I have to deal with, like you, you should let me go out because you're going to grow up and leave me. Yeah, she seems to regard gold digging as her job, which I guess in a weird way is I respect the professionalism there. Yeah. Um, but it does lead to some awkward things like her commenting that her latest conquest was all bark and no stick. Yeah, that's, that's Gross. disgusting. But it's an interesting relationship. I hope we get some more of that built out in season two. Also, while they're talking, she says because this guy is all bark and no stick. The the deal about this is the pickings are so slim. Just look at your father, for example. That's what we're working with. And in that moment, as she's complaining about Johnny, she reveals to Robbie that Johnny came by the bar, visited her, and suggested that Robbie go live with Johnny for a while. And Robbie's like, thoughtful. Robbie's a latchkey kid, unfortunately. So let's go talk to our other favorite latchkey kid, Miguel, back over at the Cobra Kai dojo. Now, Miguel's not a latchkey kid. His grandma's always taking care of him. Oh, that's true. He's, he's got his yaya, absolutely. Yeah. Johnny drops some more Cobra Kai wisdom here. Uh, the, there's only one reason to hit someone, and that's to inflict pain, according to Johnny. Of course. That, that is very Sith. And meanwhile, <laughs> the doorbell rings because Aisha's coming through the door. That's right. Aisha has come to call. Johnny assumes, of course, that she's here for yoga. Right. I mean, you know, Johnny is no stranger to unfair assumptions. And he also assumes that uh, no women are allowed in Cobra Kai. It's not that there are no women allowed. It's there's no girls in Cobra Kai. He's painted a big no girls allowed sign outside. Exactly. Yeah, with a backwards R. And so, you know, Miguel is already like, here we go again. My sexist dad. Mm -hmm. And pulls Johnny into the office and is like, hey, listen, this is a student you need. And Johnny's like, come on, don't tell me I'm sexist. Like, they have tiny hollow bones. So Johnny's just being the typical child. And Miguel, again, is the pragmatist. While they're talking, we see the whiteboard behind Miguel that says, current students, Miguel. Miguel has a great point here. Gender aside, Aisha is a paying customer. Her dad is a Hall of Fame linebacker for the Chargers. Yes. Miguel's play isn't for complete gender equality. It's that, hey, you can't afford not to take this student. The student will keep coming and will keep giving you money. Miguel does the, you know, diplomatic Miguel thing of trying to put things into terms Johnny can at least understand. So Johnny tells Aisha that he's giving it a second thought and 
she can stay. On the condition that she can't act like a girl. She can't act like a girl. She's like, what do girls do? And he's all, oh, don't give me that. You know, all emotional, loud, complaining. Which is hilarious because Johnny then takes that exact opportunity to get loud, emotional, and complaining. And another little screenwriter's joke. He's asking Aisha as he paces back and forth like a large cat or a drill sergeant. And he's like, why are you here? And, and she describes the state of bullying in 21st century America. Well, specifically, she describes cyberbullying, to which Johnny is disgusted. Yeah, he, Johnny is not impressed. Johnny, much to our surprise, doesn't necessarily bemoan that Aisha is being treated poorly. He just doesn't respect modern bullies because in his eyes they have no honor exactly they have to bully you to your face in order to truly be honorable bullies right in order to truly have a just trial of strength johnny's position is that bullying is a form of social contract exactly i'm going to show you how to teach them a lesson with your fists Fair you enough. can tell that Aisha's into that. Cut back to LaRusso Auto Group, where Daniel, very comfortable in his office, is still working on Armand. We've got the second beat of this scheme from Daniel. Is that a New York Mets bobblehead? If so, that is totally Ralph Macchio's actual bobblehead on his desk. Oh, for sure. Daniel R- LaRusso is only a step or two removed from Ralph Macchio. Throughout the season, he references like following various New York sports teams and things like that. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, you know, Daniel's heart is very much still back in New Jersey, even though he's probably lived in California more of his life at this point. Meanwhile, he's on the phone with Zarkarian, who has been inspired to go get a boba tea, and he's not impressed with this boba moba tea, Mm -hmm. as he says. He says that he's not going to sell Daniel the strip mall because he senses there's more to it than that, and he's not going to be taken by a car salesman. No money, no parts, no deal. Daniel's like, whatever, man. You're not even getting the market rate for the property right now. You're not managing it well anyway. And so they get off the phone after Zarkarian has, you know, said, whatever. Screw you, car man. Yeah, basically, screw <laughs> Yes, screw you, car man, is what he says. You'd think that Daniel, because of how flustered he's been for most of the season, would be upset. But instead, he's actually happy because he's gotten what he wanted. We will find out. You'd think Zarkarian has put the kibosh on Daniel, but Daniel has another play in he mind. Does. Meanwhile... In or near the strip mall parking lot. Yasmin and Moon are hotboxing in their new Mercedes. So that's Moon's fancy Mercedes. Smoking some pot. I think Moon said her mom gave her for a birthday. And lo and behold, here comes Lynn, who has yes. a giant sign saying, give me money. Yeah, crazy cat lady uh, from earlier. We don't know that she has cats. I'm making a Simpsons reference. Oh, I see. <laughs> Well, I guess you've been waiting for the moment to drop that in, haven't you? But can anyone who loves animals that much really be crazy? (laughs) I thought about it a couple times. But yeah, this is the crazy cat lady that Johnny has been dealing with. She is now harassing Yaz and Moon in their Mercedes. And Moon is reaching over to lock the door when boom... In comes Samantha into the back seat through the back door, like, what the hell is going on? Why are you ignoring me? Yeah. Uh, Sam bursts in. She must make amends. And so she climbs into the back of this Mercedes Benz. And (laughs) she proceeds to get the information from Yaz and Moon that Kyler's been spreading some nasty rumors about her. They're not talking to her because he said that she'd badmouth them. But the other thing is that he's been telling everyone that Sam went down on him in that theater. Mm-hmm. Alanis Morissette style. Yeah, 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 I know. Isn't it ironic? I think. You know, she's like, that's not the way it went down. And they're like, whatever. You just apologize and we can be friends again. But Samantha does have a line that she's not willing to cross. Yeah. She's not going to grovel and, and say it's made up stuff just to remain popular. So she storms off. Yeah. And leaves Yasmin and Moon there in the sports car. I I found it was very interesting that uh, Moon was a little more reticent to to be as hard on Sam as Yaz is. And uh, that's a little crumb that we might pick up later as well. Yeah. And, you know, it's also worth pointing out at this moment, like, of course, Kyler would spread lies about Sam because it's all about these bully trials of strength. And mm-hmm. He's all about maintaining his standing so that he can get laid as much as possible or yeah. collect whatever counts for capital for a teenage douche bro. He wants those notches on his bedpost and it's gross, but it is also typical teenage popular clique 
Viper's Nest behavior. He's got to get that something about Mary Jo. Speaking of Viper's Nest, let's jump back over to the Cobra Kai dojo. Yeah, Johnny's got Aisha and Miguel standing opposite each other on the mats. It's beginning to look a teeny bit like Cobra Kai under crease with people facing off. And then he's like, Mr. Diaz, show Ms. Robinson everything that you've learned. That's right. Johnny wants Miguel to wail on Aisha. Yeah, and and Miguel is like, I'm not going to do that. She's a girl. And... Aisha's like, this is my first day. And Johnny's like, you got to go face first into the fire. Johnny's like, "Uh, your enemies don't care what day it is, Aisha. But so he's like, fight. And they don't get started. And it takes a couple of tries. Then finally, Miguel takes a run at Aisha, uh, kicks her square in the gut with such force that she falls backward onto the ground. Oh, my God. Aisha, are you okay? And she's mad as hell that this has happened. And then she wails on him. (laughs) Runs straight for him like a linebacker, throws him down, and then jumps yeah. straight on him and knees him in the sternum. That's a good call. That is a straight-up linebacker move. Uh, of course, because her dad is the Hall of Fame linebacker for the Chargers. Yeah. Well, the other thing that's interesting about this scene is, much in the way that Miguel kind of turned the gender equality tables on Johnny earlier, Johnny turns them right back on Miguel when he asks him to beat up on Aisha. Exactly. Uh, so I thought that was interesting as well. That is kind of a typical response of people who are like, okay, you want gender equality? Then go do this thing, even if yeah. the person is unfairly positioned to still excel more right yeah. but in this case aisha has her own resources of strength and can kick the crap out of miguel so it's okay well johnny is very impressed with uh oh, yeah. aisha's display of unrepressed rage uh <laughs> exclaiming that the girl is a natural cobra but the fight is interrupted by the sound of squabbling next door and so uh, johnny's got to go investigate yeah this is a pretty cool transition because it's like we're jumping from one scene to the other but it feels seamless because it's, it's all taking place concurrently meanwhile there is zarkarian talking to nestor in the mini mart with roland his son playing on his phone roland is dressed up in sort of the all saints equivalent of a lord fontenoy costume we get the information that armand is cracking down on the rent for ev- yeah. or everyone in the strip mall everyone in the strip mall and nestor probably can't pay it armand doesn't care he's like you know whatever then i'll get mm-hmm. a new tenant the other thing about that scene is that it gives me my favorite line ever which is... You go ahead! I'm trying to run a karate dojo next door. And off they go, and now Johnny's really got to find more students. So Robbie is back at the apartment that he shares with his mom. Cut to night, where Robbie is Cobra Kai curious and visiting the website that oh, Miguel designed right. for Johnny. Yes. Because, you know... His mom had said that his dad was interested in having him go live with him. So he's thinking about it. I mean, it's no fun. As he's looking at this, sitting there in the living area, his mom walks in with a new flavor of the month. Some other guy that doesn't know that Robbie's there, doesn't notice him at all. It's like, my son is sleeping, drags this guy into the bedroom. And to avoid them, just like his father, Robbie has these headphones and he puts them on. We saw Johnny wearing those headphones in The Karate Kid, and now Robbie's got his headphones on. This is very interesting. Robbie hides in his headphones much as uh, we've seen his pop do. It's obvious that Robbie is not feeling this situation with his mom. I can't imagine anybody would, really, under these circumstances. It's all a little bit seedy and gross. Speaking of seedy and gross... Johnny is offering up a well-loved copy of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition to a guy at a pawn shop. Yeah, uh, Johnny, again, not thinking tactically here. He's going to a pawn shop that is apparently in this same strip mall as the dojo. So the pawn shop owner, he's like, I can't pay you out as much as I might have like a week ago. In the process of trying to get money out of the man at the pawn shop, we see how little Johnny actually has, or at least how little he has that he's willing to part with. And everything that he has is from the 80s. He's got a a sleeve of Franklin Mint coins. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, that look like they might actually be just like golden wrappers with chocolates inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got that Sports Illustrated with, of course, Elle McPherson. Because I, when I feel like growing up, she, when I was growing up in the 80s, she was on every cover of every Sports Illustrated. But that's probably my imagination. I mean, I'm a Kathy Ireland fan myself. I thought you really liked me. You said I was special. So yeah, and the other thing he has, of course, is the Nintendo, which is actually... Uh, an Atari. Indeed. Yeah. So yeah, we can tell that Johnny isn't only hanging on to stuff from the past, he's hanging on to ideas about the past. So yeah, Johnny does not have a lot to barter with. He does not have a lot of capital. Uh, It's all tied up in the dojo, I would think. You know, he brings his box of worthless things back to the dojo, drops it on the desk, looks inside his mini fridge, and lo, there are no Coors banquets left. He's going to have to go to the mini mart. Even the mini fridge is out of his beloved banquets, so he has to jump over to the mini mart. And as he walks to the mini mart, you see in the distance 
a fancy Audi car turning into the parking lot yes. and creeping along behind him. In the background, very low, the sort of sinister music of a TV serial or like L.A. Law. Yes. Or what is another show like that? Not Silk Stockings, but one of those kind of shows. Oh, I know exactly like Silk Stockings. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, like <laughs> you can't mess with the classics. No, indeed, that's like playing, and so we can tell that something is about to happen. So he walks into the mini mart. Nestor's there. Apparently, Nestor lives there, and Johnny's reaching down for the absolute last of the Coors banquets. He's probably already bought all of the other ones out, and while he's pulling them out from behind a box of Modelo, he hears a familiar voice behind him. It's Daniel. The door opens, and Daniel Larusso is like, "Got any spray paint?" He's Columboing Johnny a little bit right he's now. He's definitely Columboing Johnny. He walks in and he knows Johnny's there and talking to Nestor, he's dropping hints to let Johnny know this is why what's happening to you is happening, Mm -hmm. right? You got a little art project, big canvas right on Ventura Boulevard. Just like this guy over here who drew a dick on my face. Johnny stands up and Nestor's gonna go get the spray paint. Then Daniel takes this opportunity to let Johnny know that he knows. And the rent seems to be going crazy out of control. Frankly, I don't know how you afford it, small business like yours. Although he does buy Johnny a beer, so it's kind of a mixed message. That's not really a mixed message. That's Daniel showing that he's got all the power, right? He's got the power to buy Johnny a beer or not. Yeah. So he's let Johnny know in one fell swoop, not only am I on to what you do with the billboard, I'm the reason your rent's going up and the reason you're having such a crappy day. Daniel's really getting dark in this episode. He's got a master plan. He's the bully in this situation. Yeah. He's got all the power and he's not afraid to turn the screws on Johnny. And that's sad coming from someone like Daniel who should know better. In this, we see a picture of Daniel's life without Mr. Miyagi, Mm -hmm. right? Daniel came in from New Jersey, and he was a kid, and he was sort of like a kid with a chip on his shoulder, and and to some extent for good reason, right? Mm -hmm. But also, like, he he was trying to be tough and and be witty and be all these things, and he was kind of on the make. And then Mr. Miyagi was like, you got to check in with yourself, man. And so we see here that Daniel's kind of out of touch. Oh, he's definitely out of touch, because when we cut back to the LaRusso manse, Amanda's there, and she is thrilled that Daniel's got some pep in his step again. He's opening a good wine to celebrate his petty victory. Yes. Uh, she asks him what's up. He says, somebody finally got some payback, but she doesn't get it. She's like, oh my God, are you going after Tom Cole again? And he's all, no, 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 it wasn't Tom Cole ever. It was Johnny Lawrence. Uh, this is something that I love about Amanda's character and that you know I love about this performance in that she is one of those characters who can see right through all the BS and she can see the big picture. Uh, she's the only sensible one in a crazy universe where she's like, all of this is not worth it for getting revenge on your high school karate rival. Daniel's swirling the wine around in the glass and he feels like the cock of the walk. And Amanda is just like, what on earth? All of this? You persuaded Zarkarian? To raise the rent on mm-hmm. the strip mall? Like- Did you even stop one second to think about what you're doing? Exactly. exactly. All these people that are going to have their rents raised who aren't Johnny Lawrence. I mean, it does raise some questions about Daniel's plan. Like, if Zarkarian had fallen for it, was Daniel just going to go ahead and buy up useless property just because he could yeah that would have been a nice thing to address in this conversation too maybe we can go there in season two but yeah meanwhile like amanda is just like all i know is i want the daniel larusso that i married to come back daniel's like the guy drew a dick on my face and she's like so what he's an asshole don't let him turn you into one yeah and so like in this moment we see that don't be an asshole dennis leary come on daniel really didn't think through anything he just went to feeling like a powerless kid again and needing to show that he could best johnny yeah he never thought about what an adult would say about his behavior speaking of reverting to high school let's revert back to high school (laughs) as sam walks into the cafeteria now having been slandered by kyler to find that no one will let her sit at their table including aisha who's really tired of all this crap and aisha even like repeats the rumor about sam which is pretty crappy sam in vain tries to reconnect with aisha because she needs to be able to connect with somebody but it's not working she's tough man she goes straight to kyler and for a minute for a split second it looks like sam is going to be the one to unload some karate on on hapless kyler well she comes over to kyler and is trying to hold him responsible she's like you're spreading lies about me Mm -hmm. 
and Kyler doubles down and is like, no, no, you know, I just said what happened. And, you know, maybe some of us saw more of the movie than others. Kyler does that thing where he lies through innuendo. Yes, exactly. But at this point, having shamed her like that, mm-hmm. Kyler then raises his voice and compares Sam to the billboard with the dick on it. At Wait. this moment, we see that Sam is mad. Uh-huh. That Kyler has gone after her dad. And it's right. that moment that we see her start to pull out her fist. Yeah, she almost unloads on him. Yeah, and she almost unloads on him. Then at that moment, though, it's shut down because Miguel says, hey, Kyler. And Miguel comes over and kicks the crap out of Kyler. Kyler's like, I'm ready for your lame-ass karate this time. <laughs> but he's not ready. He's not ready for Miguel's karate. And it is not lame-ass. It's Cobra Kai. Once Miguel steps in, Miguel engages in one of the best fight sequences of this series. Miguel takes Kyler, rams him in the face, and kicks the crap out of him. Actually, you know, Kyler pushes back. It's not a total knockout from Miguel at first, but, like, he's just beating the crap out of Kyler, bringing him down. And then at that point... All of his lackeys step in. Brooks, the other guy whose name we don't know. Well, I mean, at this point, Miguel's running on adrenaline and the automatic reflexes kick in. All the dunking in the pool, all the getting hit by uh, softballs from the pitching machine. All that comes into play here as Miguel leaps over tables, jumps up on chairs. Sweeps the leg. He does sweep the leg. He does, he sweeps Brooks' leg. All classic Cobra Kai techniques. And having dropped everybody, Mm -hmm. he then stands on the top of a cafeteria table. And before he's pulled away by Counselor Blatt, who suddenly isn't as enthusiastic about karate as she was when she was macking on Daniel LaRusso, Miguel manages to make eye contact with Sam. And the beautiful 80s, 90s John Hughes love sounding music. Yeah, Miguel gets removed. It's a scene. uh, Everybody has their phones out. Everyone's Uh, cheering for Miguel. Everyone's cheering. We cut over to the Cobra Kai dojo where Miguel explains everything to Johnny. Uh, Johnny's like, rather than being excited, we're screwed. Your mom's going to kill me. And Miguel's like, don't worry. When they called, my grandma talked to them. And it's no big deal. Everything came together, Miguel says. Yeah. And Johnny's like, well, let me get this straight. You did this. You did that. You know. Johnny could not be more thrilled. And, uh, you know, neither could I. All credit to uh, Jolo and Hirokota and the rest of the stunt team, because they really made that fight feel organic and fluid and fresh and i really enjoyed it even though he didn't see it johnny's super impressed and they go out to the the parking lot where he opens the sort of hatchback trunk of his firebird and there we see folded perfectly Mm -hmm. in the middle of an otherwise empty trunk the crisp white gi that johnny wore when he was training for his first competition back in what 81 Mm -hmm. yeah and miguel's looking on in awe yeah johnny is now handing this to him the torch is being passed Johnny shakes his hand. You know who else is looking on? That, well, Robbie's looking on because Robbie has walked up with a backpack and a skateboard, clearly about to approach Johnny and ask if he can stay with him for a few days. But then Mm -hmm. when he sees that Johnny's actually like hugging some kid and giving him something, something that's never happened for Robbie. Robbie pulls a Polonius What do you mean a Polonius? He's skulking behind the curtains, spying on, on what's going on. But spoiler alert, Polonius winds up dead. I didn't say it was a perfect metaphor. No, indeed. There are a few perfect metaphors in life. It doesn't matter because... And, and I have to say, like, this scene is just such a dagger. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Hamlet, it's like a dagger. Maybe my metaphor is better than I thought it was. Maybe so. But yeah, because... You don't even realize that you care about Robbie, Mm -hmm. but suddenly you're like, man, I'm so sorry that this happened. Yeah. Speaking of Shakespeare, Sholo is being played the fool to a certain extent here. That's true. I mean, it's all well meant by everyone. That's how tragedy is. It doesn't even occur to Johnny that he's doing anything that Robbie could ever be jealous of. And it doesn't, of course, it doesn't occur to Johnny that Robbie might be watching him. Johnny has taken at face value what Shannon told him because Johnny hasn't really reflected enough to realize that Robbie actually is young enough to still have the capacity to care. Mm -hmm. It's just really upsetting. And you know how I don't like it when when someone is hurt like that. No, it's not comfortable at all. It's pretty devastating at this point. And we're rapidly approaching the end of the episode. We're reaching the halfway point in the entire series. So we're getting a lot of uh, scenes jumping back and forth where we're setting up some pins that are going to get knocked down in the second half of the season. Yeah, you got to wonder if Robbie and Johnny have ever even hugged. And then having just seen the seeds of tragedy being planted... 
we see Daniel pulling up and walking up the hill at a cemetery full of autumnal leaves, which is that California? That could be Georgia. I mean, this could be Griffith Park adjacent or something like that. Are yeah. there that many leaves that fall in California? I mean, again, it's California, right? They have a thing for guys in chicken suits. Uh huh. They have a thing for eggs. Uh huh. Giant Halloween parties. True. Anything else that I've missed? Um, everybody is smoking pot. That doesn't happen in Georgia. Well. Come on. Well, not certainly not out in the open. Let's not sell our friends on the East Coast short. Meanwhile, Daniel is at the cemetery mm-hmm. visiting Mr. Miyagi's grave. So as soon as the Zamfir music plays, we know that it's going to be emotionally heavy. Uh, yeah, we're getting the original Karate Kid movie cues here uh, because we're Daniel has decided to to pay a visit to Mr. Miyagi's grave. And it, this is interesting because not only is it a beautiful headstone that's sort of off to itself alone, the name on the headstone, the last time we saw Pat Morita on screen in the next Karate Kid, his name was Kasune Miyagi. And we know that because he was honored for being one of the members of the 442nd. And in this in this show, the, this version of his name is Nariyoshi Miyagi. And we see also that his dates are June 9th, 1925 to November 15th, 2011. Yes. So he's significantly um, older than Pat Morita was when he made, like, like Mr. Miyagi's age. Pat Morita was playing a man who was far older than he actually was. Okay. At that time. And it says on the headstone, beloved husband, father, teacher, and war hero. And okay. it notes the 442nd and his Medal of Honor. This is clearly all Daniel's doing. Mm-hmm. So this is a really very nice scene. It's very poignant. Daniel appears at Mr. Miyagi's graveside to kind of reflect a little bit and try and think of the kind of advice that Mr. Miyagi would give him. He spends a few moments grooming the bonsai tree. It's, it's a very nice moment. You know, Ralph Macchio really delivers here for this scene. Yeah, I mean, one thing about this scene that really gets me is we, we've seen him, I think, in almost every scene dressed like he's at the office or like he's going to the office. Mm-hmm. Like even at the Halloween dance, he looks very officious in his dad clothes. And here, going to visit Mr. Miyagi, he's got like a leather jacket on. He's wearing sneakers. He looks like a kid. Of course, he's talking to Mr. Miyagi's grave because it wouldn't be a graveside visit in a TV property if they didn't talk to the grave. And he tells Mr. Miyagi, like, he's just really missing him. He feels kind of lost. And When I was a kid, you seemed to always have all the answers. And I guess I thought when I got older, I'd have it all figured out, too. Now we see behind the mask that Daniel's been fronting this whole time because he's afraid that he doesn't have any answers and he doesn't know what to do. And at the moment when Ralph Macchio stands up then and, and bows, like they ha- he, he, he finishes grooming the bonsai tree and gets a little choked up and then he stands up and bows to the grave. At this moment, Daniel returns to the car and it's also at this moment that on a glance back towards the grave site, Daniel is hit by his own moment of uh, flashback reflection. Maybe it's the way he's holding the steering wheel. Maybe Maybe. it's the fact that he's in a convertible with the top down. Yeah, but he flashes back all the way back to 84. 84, when Mr. Miyagi is given him the 1948 Ford convertible for his birthday. Yeah, and and we get a nice video support here of the balance speech. All life have a balance. Everything be better. Understand? <laughs> yeah, I understand. And Ralph Macchio sells this so hard mm-hmm. and is so moved. And, you know, as Mr. Miyagi in the past asks young Daniel, do you understand? Ralph Macchio in the present says, I understand. And then, Took you long enough, Daniel. It took you long enough. We're not yet sure what he understands, <laughs> but we know that he's found some understanding. And meanwhile, Johnny is pulling up in his Firebird back at the strip mall. He's yeah. on the phone with someone who's obviously Zarkarian saying, you'll get your damn money or you'll get your damn rent. Lo and behold, there is a giant crowd of kids yes. waiting outside the dojo. Teenagers who are all looking at their phones. They're looking at, we see as he walks by, a video of karate versus bullying. Johnny pulls up to the dojo to discover he has a whole dojo full of new potential students that want a little bit of that Cobra Kai mojo. Exactly. Well said. Thank you. I wrote it. And then we cut to Miguel standing at the door looking very proud of himself because, mm-hmm. you know, he's brought all this business here. 
<laughs> Meanwhile, Daniel is back at his home dojo, making it back into a dojo, taking all the pool noodles out, taking all the old kids' toys out, and unfurling all the old scrolls on the walls. Daniel's setting up his dojo, and he's got, uh, you know, all the... He's got some nice pictures of Mr. Miyagi. He's got pictures of himself with young Sam. He's got his classic gi up on the wall uh, with the uh, bonsai tree logo on the back of it. Bonsai tree. He is going back to karate. And we yes. see that Amanda catches sight of him and she realizes as well what this means, that Daniel yes. is rediscovering himself. Mm-hmm. He did not need a cross-country motorcycle tour as she feared. In fact, all he needed was some some good old school karate. And there's a moment right in the fields when he polishes and puts up a picture of Mr. Miyagi on a shelf. And, and fun fact, screen cap from the next Karate Kid, that yeah. picture. If you're on that Easter egg hunt, that's where that picture is from, for sure. And in what seems to be an episode full of ending scenes, we jump back over to LaRusso Motors, where Robbie now has a scheme of his own. We see Amanda then at LaRusso Auto. Mm-hmm. Um, we're in the same clothes. It looks like the same day. And she's talking to Robbie, who is posing as a slightly older version of himself. And he's like, I'm just taking some time to figure things out. Whenever Robbie says, like, take in instead of take Taking, you know that he's trying to take someone with a scam there he is talking to amanda and she thinks he's totally fine her husband's taking a personal day or that she'd introduce them but mm-hmm. how soon can he start and so we see that now robbie is going to work at LaRusso Auto. This feels so sinister. It's obviously another con. I mean, yeah, at this point, Robbie is clearly up to something and we don't know what and that could mean anything for Daniel. Presumably that's the only reason that Robbie would be doing this is because if he had some ulterior motive. Yeah, and like, it's just, it's such a downer because we've just seen Daniel start to rediscover himself and now Robbie is coming into the picture. Exactly. What is this even going to do? I confess that when I first saw this scene, I was like, oh my God, I don't even like this guy that much. And now he's coming to work for LaRusso Auto. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the way it's going to go. It's getting so soapy Cobra Kai. But I should have known it would be more complicated and more interesting than that. It's soapy in the very best way. Um, It's high quality soap. All organic. Yes. Small batch. Mm -hmm. Handmade. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's totally Dr. Bronner's. Meanwhile, back at the LaRusso Mance one more time. Yeah. We see that Daniel has done cleaning out the dojo. He's put the finishing touches on his dojo. He's opening up a little box. And inside this small wooden box is the original Tinegui cloth that he tied around his head in the Karate Kids. And he wraps it around his head. And then we see as the camera pans back, he's wearing a white gi. It's not mm-hmm. like the gi. Well, the, the gi is up on the wall, of presumably because he's grown out of it. But Well, and also because it's, you know, art. Mrs. Miyagi stitched that a long time ago. That is true. So, yeah, yeah Daniel's got his grown-up gi on. And he is doing his kata. We get the cues from the original Karate Kid, a little bit more of that Zamfir music. And it's uh, really a nice, powerful moment. I, I really love it. Uh, yeah, it, it's a, they, they use, they build as he does his kata and moves around. Mm-hmm. Like, they start playing the theme music from the Karate Kid from the moment when he builds up to the crane kick against Johnny Lawrence. Yeah, exactly. If you don't feel something here, Karate Kid fans, you're dead inside. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty great to see Ralph Macchio going all the way, taking it super seriously. Mm -hmm. And then as he executes one final move, the camera, they fade out to a placard. They fade out to In Memory of Pat Morita, which is very nice. So that is the rundown of what happened in episode five, Counterbalance. But now we should talk about it a little bit. So Jenny, how do you feel about this episode? Well, I mean, this is my my third favorite episode of Cobra Kai. I feel like this episode is very suspenseful. It's very, very satisfying for me because having, like most people on planet Earth who saw The Karate Kid having loved Daniel LaRusso, it's been really, really crappy to watch him be kind of a jerk and be off his game, mm-hmm. and to be not endearing. Like, I don't really see it as a competition between Daniel and Johnny, but, like, it's been hard to see Johnny getting all the interesting screen time. And, and now Daniel is becoming really interesting again, and we see that Daniel has it has more to do. It's really satisfying to see him coming into his own, and it's also great to see Miguel coming into his own. I feel like in this, the two karate kids, past and present, Daniel and Miguel, obviously, 
um, the two POV Karate Kid characters, um, they both come into their own. We see Miguel kick so much ass, and it's such so gratifying because they've already laid so much groundwork for it that the payoffs feel real. How do you feel about this episode? It's nice to finally see a lot of the stuff that was planted in the first half of the season start to come to fruition in a tangible way. We get our first really good fight scene. You know, not that it's all about that, but I think that shows you expect it from a a show that's, you know, based on the Karate Kid. I think that... It's nice to see the characters growing and changing a little bit, and you know that will continue as the season goes along. But we're starting to finally get out of the woods a little bit with all the problems that were set up in the first half of the season. Some of it is leading to new problems. It's good to see that you know Aisha is now in the mix and becoming a bigger character. It's good to see, you know, Amanda has a lot of good stuff to do in this episode. Robbie continues to be a little schemer, and we don't know what he's up to, but is there's a really, lot of possibility in that. He's not only a little schemer, though. I was going to say, like, in this in this episode, I remember as we watched it, we were like, what's the deal with Robbie? Yeah. Like, what's going to happen with Robbie? Yeah. I frankly, at this moment, didn't see the rest coming. Well, that's the other thing, is that this particular episode is one of the episodes that drives home how much of an ensemble show this is it's not just the johnny daniel rivalry the johnny daniel rivalry is fun it's exciting to see those two kind of square off of against each other because sparks fly every time and it's very engaging but this is a show that's very good about treating its cast equitably and giving everybody something to do. Everybody has a plot line. Every, all sorts of wheels are in motion. And that's always fun to see. The ensemble work in this episode, this is an, a strong ensemble show. It's especially strong in this episode. I think that this episode points to the comedy background of the showrunners. Mm-hmm. It's all re- really well balanced. This, the, the funny aspects, the, the moments of like reality... Um, Like when Amanda's like, what are you doing? The moments of discomfort that could mean something else is going to happen. Like when Robbie watches Johnny and Miguel, it's all perfectly balanced so that you never linger in one feeling for too long. Mm -hmm. You can really see that both Daniel and Johnny are coming to their power play from an honest place. Although Daniel's fronting a bit, like both of them have reasons for thinking the other is their enemy. In this, so far, Daniel has been the bigger jerk to Johnny, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would say so. Like, well, also their modes of aggression are different. Johnny is very direct with his aggression. Despite the fact that Johnny is a bully of the old school variety, like his aggression was directed towards the bullies in episode one. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the last time his anger was taken out on another person. Everything else has been him either vandalizing something or, you know, destroying something uh, or just kind of being self-destructive and getting drunk and going to pass out somewhere. So whereas Daniel's aggression and anger, Daniel knows who he, he is angry at, but other than like kicking a boba tea out of someone's hands or, you know, Like, all his aggression is about trying to outsmart his opponent. Like, you know, trying to buy the strip mall out from under Johnny and things like that. But we see how both of their impulses are so caught up in their feelings from the past. Mm -hmm. Like, Daniel's coming at Johnny as if Johnny is an equally positioned rival. But the tools that they use to do war with each other, for Johnny, it's like, you know, mocking and shame. It's like painting a dick on a billboard that LaRusso is so rich he can easily have that painted over. Whereas Daniel, when he goes to the mattresses, he's like going after Johnny's livelihood. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just it's not just a moment of bad branding with with a with a phallic billboard. It's like he's actually pulling the dojo out from under Johnny because he's cutting into the rent. Now, again, I understand why Daniel's doing this because despite the fact that he he's articulating it in the language of a grudge, Cobra Kai did do some terrible things back that's in the day. That's true. Not to spoil anything to come, but yeah, that's something that Daniel only seems to understand is the gravity of possibly, potentially having Cobra Kai 
back as a force in the valley. And we see a little bit of it in the school cafeteria scene. It's you're giving emotionally unstable teenagers the power to just wail on each other. And I could easily see a situation where this where in season two, this kind of becomes an arms race where it's like everybody is trying to get signed up for a dojo and get karate so that they can defend themselves. They can be the top dog. It's a bit of the gunslinger's dilemma from a Western. It's like, no matter how good a gunslinger you are, there's always going to be some kid coming up thinking that they're a little bit faster and eventually uh, maybe someone will be. One of the challenges for this show is, I think, staying true to that impulse that is so entertaining and also I think the characters, and by this I mean Johnny and Daniel's, real need to make amends with each other. I think that we don't see this yet, but I, I think when we see these two characters fight, it's not just that we love to see them fight, it's that we want to see them become closer, whether they're fighting or friends. And yeah. so, you know, you can't constantly be at war and get ever closer to someone, or maybe you can. I mean, that makes for the best drama, right? Yeah, did you have anything else you wanted to say about that particular thing? No. Nope. So, you know, the other thing that I'd like to point out is just to go briefly back to the scenes with Sam beginning to uh, beat up on Kyler and also for a longer period of time, the scene with um, Miguel and Aisha where Miguel is showing Aisha everything he learned. Unsurprisingly, this relates to a lot of issues that are happening in martial arts as uh, they become gender inclusive, more women take classes alongside men, vice versa. It's been pointed out in an article for The Conversation. It was written by some sports sociologists and psychologists that are um, based in the UK, Craig Owen, Alex Channon, and George Jennings. They talk about all the different ways in which Cobra Kai intersects with contemporary research in kinesiology and other fields on martial arts. And mm. they point out some journal articles about the ways in which um, the, the Miguel and Aisha scene is particularly relevant to contemporary research. At the same time, I mean, it, that speaks to all, also Sam's not being into karate, right? Like, if you're if you're you know set for success as a woman in high school, as an upwardly woman in, in high school, and you know from Encino Hills, like you might not be like karate is the way to go. Like, no women are doing karate. It's not. It's something that you did as a kid that your dad was into, right? But there's no pathway for her to do it. So you, if you blink, you would miss, you would miss Sam brandishing her fists before Miguel steps in to beat up on Kyler. I will make sure that we link that article in the show notes. Yes, good call. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for our talk about Cobra Kai, uh, episode five, Counterbalance. Our next episode on Cobra Kai will be a recap and analysis of episode six, which is Quiver. We've also got a holiday special coming your way where we sit down for a long one and talk about The Karate Kid Part 2. That's right. A.K.A. Daniel LaRusso goes to Okinawa. Yes, I cannot wait. Yes, nor can I. All right, well, until then, uh, I've been Colin Canada. I've been Jenny Carlson. And we'll see you around the Miyagiverse. See you around the Miyagiverse. This podcast has been produced and hosted by Colin Canaday and Jenny Carlson. Our music is by Chepo. You can find us online at areyoukaratekiddingme.com and wherever you download podcasts.